The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. This is not the message. Aren't you glad? That's my writing. But Rebecca had, Pastor Rebecca did a chart for me that I think is just absolute, look at that. That's perfect. That's better than I can write. We already know that part though, right? So this is part six of how do I do that? But you know what? It's actually kind of good that I'm doing the end first because this sets the stage for anything that you would teach because you'd be surprised how many people uh, over the years, uh, oh, that would be good for so-and-so, but not me. I, I dealt with everything, all right, which that in itself needs a counseling appointment because <laughs> unless you've gone off with Enoch and just off in the gut. But <clears throat> I thought this was funny because this is uh, uh, in times of crises, people you do things in times of crisis where uh, your actions, um, you say, where did that come from? And it's the fact that what we've been teaching for years now is that nobody really knows themselves. God knit you in your mother's womb before you had a chance to get all dysfunctional, before you had a chance to have this marvelous personality and that great hairdo and that great automobile and all before all of that he knit you together in his mother's womb so in reality if someone's going to untie the knitting it needs to be god himself not man man is extremely limited but okay there's a there's an intimidating thing here <clears throat> this was this was a, a, a essentially developed um, by actually they call it the johari window uh, they should say johari window but um, it was developed by its inventors, Joseph Luft and Harry Ingham. So it was Joe and Harry. So this is not too complicated so far. But this was a, a, a key for understanding ourselves and as Christians to really pursue God and to really deepen that relationship uh, because it is very common for people to get saved and feel like they got fire insurance and they just kind of camp out there for years. Oh, then go to church, learn more about God, but not necessarily is there an internal transformation. Now, this window has four panes in it. It divides our personal awareness into four different levels. Uh, here's the part. Known to self are the things that you're open, you're open to. Others know what you're open to because you told them, all right? Then there's things that you have purposely hidden in your life. You don't talk about it uh, in, in, in ministry sometimes, even trying to uh, get through rough spots. People go, I, I don't want to go there. All right, that's because you want to keep it secret and you don't want to deal with it. It's hidden. Other people don't know about it. You know about it. So as far as you knowing yourself, there's things you're open to other people know it because it's, you're vulnerable. What's not known to others is what's hidden. Okay. Vulnerability is part of a, of a key to grow spiritually, being vulnerable first to God. People as they earn your trust. But So what you know about yourself is what you're open to, but you have hidden areas. Now, what is not known to self, pay attention to this, blind spots. Everybody has blind spots. And those blind spots you call normal, or that's the way it is. Here's the scary part of our blind spots. This is the part where you start crying. All right. It's known by other people. Oh, no. I've got blind spots. I don't know what they are, but other people know. 
it would take fantastically great humility to say, God, search me for my blind spots. I want to know what they are because guess what? Other people know it. Oh, no. So they know what you're open to, but they also know your blind spots. You don't know your blind spots. The things that are hidden, it's not known by others. And this unknown area. Now, this little box is the same size as all of these, but this is the, would be the equivalent to the uh, subconscious, the unknown. It would be like the known would be like a grain of sand. The unknown would be like the universe. That's how big the difference is. So the most important thing an individual can do to really see progress in their Christian life you know, some people never changed much since they got saved. But if they really were serious, uh, there's an area of the unknown that God knows. Only God knows. And this is why I'm such a proponent of being God-searched rather than man-searched. Man's limited to his little grain of sand, no matter if his IQ is well above genius, he's still got one little grain of sand of sea compared to the original creator God who made you. The God who made you, and if there's tangles, he knit you together in your mother's womb, who would you want to untangle it? I would rather God would pick and choose and show me what to deal with. However, I would have to let him go into the unknown. Now, David, in the scriptures, offers us, and this is a, a scripture that's worth writing down and reading it again and again. David offers us an excellent example to how to see the Lord's help for healing our hurt. David allowed God full access, kept nothing consciously with it, withheld or hidden. And here's his approach. And all of us need this. And for healing, for deliverance, David admitted to God that unknown things that were lodged in his heart could possibly lead to serious repercussions later. Greater sin. As a matter of fact, even uh, the early church, we taught it in the Didache. Before there was a New Testament, uh, the rabbis taught, even under the Old Covenant, they taught fences like don't murder, don't commit adultery, but they would teach you offense would be deal with it when it's still a lust. Deal with it when it's still an anger before it becomes murder. If you would put fences and, and guard your heart, you would, you would not commit the big sins. Now here's what David did, though. He says, who can understand his errors? That's the kind of humility that's necessary in the church because there's far too many that think they understand but know-it-alls are not happy people. And, they <laughs> and it says, cleanse me, Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13. Cleanse me from secret faults. Who are they secret from? It's in the area of the unknown. That means you don't know, I don't know, but God knows. If I'm going to submit to searching, I want to be God-searched versus man-searched. Man has his opinions. And the only part where man might have something is, doggone it, he can see your blind spots. <laughs> so it keeps you humble with man. Confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. There is a place for that. However, in almost all cases, blind spots, one of the toughest lies to defeat is something that has history. Because you'll say, that's the way it's been. That's the way it's always been. That's the way I am. That's normal. So here's the problem with a blind spot. The blind spot is you may see uh, an area in your life better than, uh, better than someone else, better than family, better than that. You, you feel one notch above family. And your one notch up might be here. But normal could be here. And you take pride in that one notch up. Well, I'm, at least I'm better than Aunt Julia. Or at least I'm better than Eleanor. Yeah, you might be better than Eleanor, but here's normal. 
here's you. And, well, I always joke around. I think I saw uh, Tom Cruise movie that had that illustration and I always tell Jennifer, Jennifer, without me, you're out here. With me, you're up here. Without me, you're down. Actually, it's the other way around, huh? Without Jennifer, I'm down here. With Jennifer, I'm up here. Where do you want to go? I want to go up here, right? Okay. So, anyway, here's the interesting thing on, on that verses uh, 12 and 13 in Psalm 19. David says, Cleanse me from secret faults and keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I will be blameless and I'll be innocent of great transgression. The wisdom in being God's search and humbling yourself like David did before God is that the weird stuff you could prevent from happening if you would deal with the little stuff. All right? That's what it's saying. Put a fence around some of those little issues that you're ignoring and saying, well, that's just the way it is. Now, uh, so the things that are known to you are what's open and the things you have purposely hidden. But you don't know the vast universe of the non-conscious. So we've taught over and over again a, a very simple principle. There's God focus versus self-focus. Jennifer telling me, always go slow, because nobody can write that fast. God-focused versus self-focused. Do you believe there's an advantage to that? How about God-searched versus self-searched? I don't know about you, but when I self-search, I can get into all kinds of stuff. I'm pretty good. I'm great. Oh, I did that good. Or I can get into that self-deprecating attitude and just say, what a loser. You're a jerk. Well, guess what? God didn't make anybody like that. He didn't make them proud. He didn't make them arrogant. To see the way God sees, the reason I love being God-searched, is I want to see myself as beautiful as he saw me, get this, before I was formed in my mother's womb. Oh, wow, before I had any comparative values, before I had a chance to mess up left and right, he saw me, and that in that beauty, he had worked in it, he created in me good works, things to do. And those are the things that I need to be about. Because in the area of the unknown and blind spots, you can honestly feel good about yourself doing, I'm doing the best that I can, and be missing the boat. You can be, in other words, sincerely wrong. <laughs> but if you're God-searched, God will reveal to you what you need to know. And he alone, this, it's the spirit that, that searches the heart. And he knows the sequence and the order even. Remember, if he knit me together in my mother's womb, I through life have messed up a lot. And I got all kinds of tangles and knots and sometimes I feel like I'm all knotted up and, oh, Lord, you're the only one that can understand this. I, I, I've used that illustration before. I watched Jennifer take a gold necklace that was tangled. I mean, she had little straight pins. and It, it was a nightmare untangling a simple necklace. How much more complicated are we and who is to say what they can do to fix us? See, I believe in that it's it's... God who is in us to will and to perform. Let him. Yielding and surrendering is almost a lost term in the church. And, but this Joe and Harry <laughs> window, the Jahari window, uh, at least if we would get to the point where we would say, God, I'm willing to see blind spots. You might as well start there because everybody else sees them. And are you humble enough that if somebody mentioned a blind spot to you, are you in a kind of a depth of a relationship where if they mentioned a blind spot, you wouldn't just ping out, have some kind of meltdown, or attack them that they don't know what they're talking about? That's usually the course. Because for you, it's normal. The devil's best tool is for a lie that has been in you for so long that you've already assumed it's true. 
That's the best tool he's got. Because you just think that's the way it is. So, having said that, God focused versus self focused. God searched versus self searched. Self search even means a counselor. Thank God for counselors. There's some people that would have been committed suicide without them. Who knows? But at the same time, they're not God. Right? So I want to be God searched is far superior and God protected. Now that part people have a hard time with because the protection is spiritual. If you are born again, you made your peace with God, the God of peace himself lives in you. And it's not poetry. The scriptures are reality. The scriptures are truth. And it says, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. Now, uh, when we were on Sid Roth one time, we did that. We, they did a reenactment of that. I worked at a halfway house um, where guys are out of prison and they're getting ready to go back into society. And uh, one of the kids didn't take his meds. And he pulled a knife, and I'm standing in front of the exit door, and he was going to run. Now, the typical procedure in the, the way they trained us anyway as helpers uh, is if somebody runs, you call the police. You don't try to stop them. And, but Dennis was obeying God, and I don't recommend you try this, but I'm standing by the door where he was going to run out, and he's pointing a knife at me, telling me he's going to cut me if he don't. And the peace of God increased to not get out of the way. Like I said, don't try this unless you know what you're doing. But the peace increased. And, you know, after that, I actually began to believe that, you know, the peace of God is not some passive thing that you just relax and let, let it be, whatever. The, why did God in the scriptures choose? And the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. If it's not militant, what is? And if it guards your heart and your mind, is that wimpy? Is that passive? Or is that militant? And powerful. I stood there, the peace increased, and I watched him. Of course, it seemed like a long time when somebody's pointing a knife at you, but it wasn't really that long. And all of a sudden, his hand started to shake. He dropped the knife. He dropped down to his knees and was crying, and they gave him his meds. And uh, But God taught us, even in traveling. We traveled once up to New England, and we were only a little ways away from our hotel, and we had already made the commitment that no person or circumstance, we're going church to church on a busy seven day a week, we were ministering somewhere and we're not going to lose our peace, right? We said, we're making that covenant. We're not going to lose it. There's nothing in life worth losing your peace over. And so we get within one exit from our hotel room and here they taped off the entire expressway in New England because there was a shootout and they claimed it was a crime scene, which it was, and they're out looking for shell casings and what have you. And I'm going, I'm dead tired. We're almost to our exit, and they put the tape across. And I said, but I'm not losing my peace over this. And this is, this is eight-lane highway. This is not a small little tributary here. They put the tape across, and I'm letting the peace of God rule, and I... I, I could move forward and upward one car by going into the left lane. But all the lanes are going this way, right? They're all going this way, but for some reason, it's, if you want to call that progress, I made one car length progress to stopped vehicles. I went there, and I, to this day, I think it was an angel. A policeman came, pulled back the tape, let a number of cars go through. I think it was eight Eight out of dozens and dozens and dozens, bumper to bumper, each row filled. And then he put the tape back, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and the tape was back, and I was the last car that went through. And I'm going like, eight cars went through, and they, they're still stopping. And we found out in the morning, it was like that till 6 o'clock in the morning. We were there late at night, 6 o'clock in the morning, it was still written off. 
But peace is a militant force and it's the rule of God. Let the peace of God rule. Who's, who's, you know, we talk about being saved, but I'll tell you what, lordship is the real issue. You can be saved and then do pretty much what you want to do. Lordship means you have internal evidence of lordship is when the peace of God is ruling regardless of people and circumstances. And uh, we talk a lot about emotional healing. Emotional healing in this church is, uh, f for the most part, uh, easier than breathing because you've learned how to be aware of God doing it, not you trying. Try. T-R-Y means to temporarily resist yielding to God. <laughs> temporarily resist. Try. Dead works. Now, now I'm going to start at the beginning. But I want to challenge people with blind spots and down here. You don't know what you think you know. It's a vast universe compared to your grain of sand of sea. And, and that could be Dr. Fahrenheit. You've got so many degrees. But you still don't know what God knows about you. Hopefully somebody's going to be curious. and going, oh, God, if what's he saying is true, search me. Well, some of it might be good. Some of it might not be so good, but whatever. Being vulnerable to God is always good. All right? Do you like this? How about you have loved ones that have blind spots? I bet you don't have the, nut, the, 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 the guts to tell them. And you probably shouldn't unless you're willing to minister to them. And unless you're willing to see your blind spots. How about that? Why don't we start with you? Uh, what a novel thought. I've seen people go like this their whole Christian life. It's them. They're the problem. They're the problem. And never deal with their own stuff. That kind of narcissism, uh, really, uh, pride comes before a fall. Yeah. And end up, life does not go well. But, uh, and besides that, we are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. But when we travel church to church, one of the major things that we saw missing was how to forgive. They were sincerely trying. But when you forgive, and we're going to cover a little bit of that now. We're going to enter into, let's pray even before we begin. I, I just love that, uh, that word yara. It's a Hebrew word for to, uh, the fear of the Lord. And it means to flow from the original source. Take heed to your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Yeah, if Jesus is in there and he's the source, he's the rock that gushes out the water. So the fear of the Lord, in its purest meaning, Yara, is the essence of life, uh, the way we were meant to flow. So we're going to flow today, all right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> it means to flow as water, actually, uh, the rock in the wilderness. You know, there's plenty of examples like that. But for us to know one thing, if God is going to teach us to live from the inside out, then we need to live in the fear of the Lord as a prerequisite. It's mandatory. If you're not connected to the source, you're going to have to learn how to forgive or repent and reconnect. But God wants you to stay connected. Abiding is what that is. John 15, we want that for experiential. All right, here we go. This is where I was supposed to start. <laughs> but I just couldn't resist it. Didn't Rebecca do a good job on that? I just love it. You should have seen my handwriting. We've seen my handwriting. I think Rebecca did better. What do you say? If, if this was a quiz. So anyway. All right. First, feel, forgive. I, I get I such a kick out of this uh, over the years is because people say, we did Dennis and Jennifer's formula. We did Gen Dennis and Jennifer's method. And in reality, our website, forgive, one, two, three. Where did that one, two, three come from? You know where that came from? That came from my, my, my genius wife, and she is well above genius, who when we got married, she said, disciple me. I don't know the things of the Spirit. I know everything theologically that you need to know, but my experience is weak. She said, teach me. And 
I lived so much by discernment. I was a baby Christian, and mental health was sending me people because they heard I got results. But I couldn't explain it to anybody else until Jennifer came along, and she said, I don't care what they said. Nobody can do that. Teach me. And because I loved her, I went, and she spoke with such authority. I said, of course I will teach you. I says, close your eyes. It's the first step because otherwise you'll stay up here figuring it out, thinking you're smart. She actually, she could be on the board of psychology in any state in the union. She scored so high on the praxis. Uh, is that the name of the test? The praxis test. For any state in the union. And she shelved it, she said, because Jesus is my counselor. So we're not dismissing that it has its value. And, and by the way, while we're on that subject, it has its value. If I had to choose between an airplane or a covered wagon to get to California, I don't want to hear any arguments about how something else worked. I'll take the airplane. And even uh, uh, Jim Gall told us once when we had a, a private meeting with him, he says, what you, other people have pioneered, you and Jennifer took and brought an acceleration to it. So uh, faster, I won't apologize for being faster, all right? That the other, th other people say, well, I do it this way, I do it that way. Fine, it works fine, but I want faster. And first feel forgive, it was like God made known to me some ways to help people get emotional healing. And the anointing that was on Jesus was to heal the brokenhearted. And to, to this day, that's, the, that's my primary passion. That's our church's passion, actually. If you're part of this, uh, oh, one of the most beautiful things uh, I've ever heard in a long time was we went out to lunch with someone and uh, they said, I want to learn this so I can help people. Oh, man, they got me wrapped around their finger now. Because I know a lot of people that would like help, but not to really help anybody else, okay? And sometimes that comes later, you know? If you're a mess, the primary focus is your mess, <laughs> you know? But if you heal that mess, be willing to help somebody else and learn this. Now, first feel forgive. And our website is forgive, one, two, three. Gee, where did that come? What a coincidence. But God was teaching us his ways like he did with Moses and the acts to the children of God. But Jennifer said, teach me. So I said, it's not a formula. What she said was, without me knowing it, when I was teaching her how to drop down to her spirit, and by the way, drop down in your Bible, you say, oh, I don't see drop down in my Bible. It's put on. And duo. Everything that says put on the Bible, put on the armor, put on the Lord Jesus, put on the new man, put on, put on, put on. All of that means to sink into, which means to go to him in order to be clothed. Let the peace of God, which is down here, guard your heart and your mind. You go down for him to come up and influence you. So, and duo is to sink into in order to be clothed. It's kind of like water baptism. You sink into the element to be totally covered. You go down in order to go up. Now, that's in dual. Yara is that while you're down there, out of my belly flows rivers of living water. Out of the fear of the Lord and maintaining that connection with him, you walk in the spirit and you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, one, two, three. Jennifer uh, said, unbeknownst to me, we, we, we both keep journals for what we feel God's saying, what scriptures are standing out, any, is there an emphasis over the last week, how have you, which is really how you preach. And she documented everything that the Holy Spirit taught her. So one was she realized she had to learn as much confidence as she has in this, she found out she has to have more confidence in this, God focus. And you can actually use both at the same time. You can chew gum and walk. Wow. <laughs> if you practice, practice makes permanent. But if you don't practice this, you will live here the rest of your Christian life. And occasional spiritual things will happen and you'll be surprised by them. I don't want to be surprised when I'm, I want them to be supernaturally natural. I don't want to just be surprised by his presence and go, Where did I have? what did I do? How was I holding my mouth? Maybe I got to do that again. All right? But 
Jennifer documented what it was, and here's, here's the first thing she, she understood, that when she closed her eyes, she could feel herself going down here, and she felt peace. And as soon I did by discerning the human spirit. Now, you don't have to discern the human spirit. You have to discern your human spirit. Don't worry about other people. You discern you. So for the longest time, I thought, I can't teach. If they're not gifted in discerning of spirits, I can't make that happen. But then I found out I don't need to make it happen. My discerning of spirits actually gave me a tool to teach other people. And so what I said, when you close your eyes, Jennifer, first person or situation that comes to mind. And she goes, no, that's my father for some reason. What's the feeling? A wall. First, feel, forgive. And by the way, you can have a complimentary uh, blue card that's on the little turnstiles on these tables. And, but don't stand up <laughs> and, and, okay, anyway, you can get them later because I'm going to teach it. No, I got one. Now, one time, well, I'm going to go slow because one time we were teaching this class and I said, this is the blue card. And one lady, what do you mean by blue? So that means go slow, Dennis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. You want to bring the little lambs along with the, the stronger lambs. You got to bring them all together like a herd. <laughs> okay. So we were in uh, New Hampshire. Or no, someone from New Hampshire. We were in Massachusetts. Someone from New Hampshire came and we did a whole course on this. Hours and hours. Not at one time, but hours and hours, several days. And a husband of a woman that was in the course, well, she knew too. Oh, I thought he came in at the end. Well, a couple came in at the end, which, you know, if you have a three-day seminar coming in the last 15 minutes, oh, well, well, you need to check your calendar. <laughs> well, they came in, and she's sitting next to her husband, and he read off the blue car, rather monotone. She sit next to him. Close your eyes. His wife closed her eyes. <laughs> Yield to Jesus in you. Focus on the first person that comes to mind. <laughs> okay. Feel the feeling. Allow yourself to feel the emotion and let Jesus, the forgiver in you, from the heart, that's, that's you and Jesus, from the heart let a river of forgiveness flow out until it changes to peace. So she wept, and the next thing you know, she got a smile on her face. And he's going, what did I do? What did I do? I, I just read off this card. <laughs> See, it's not a method, and it's not a technique. It's the way the Holy Spirit works. If you get out of the way and let him. Amen. He didn't need, this guy wasn't Joe Heavy speaker. He just read off a piece of paper. But she, com she yielded to the Spirit of God within her, and it worked phenomenally well. Jennifer documented and said, well, all I know is when Dennis told me to quit thinking, he, I had Jennifer put her hand on her gut. I said, pay attention to what's going on in there. You know, pay attention to what's going on in there. If, I was shocked at how many Christians didn't know how to locate. Matter of fact, I think we'd cover that on Tuesday. Nobody's going to be able to read that. But anyway, your will is here, not there. Your will is here. Your conscience is here. The door of the heart is here. Creativity flows from here up to inspire your mind. Creativity intuitiveness, revelation to the mind. The only thing that's up here is your thoughts. How about those other parts? Don't you think we ought to learn how, they, how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that he can have all of those parts? We were in a church of a thousand people 
And just to show, I said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Quick, point to Jesus. 98% pointed to, there's a disconnect here relationally. Christianity is supposed to be a relationship, not a religion. And out of that relationship, they were more comfortable with him far away, even after hearing Christ in you, in you, in you, the hope of glory, they still pointed to heaven. Distance is a deception, and God wants to close that gap, but you have to become more God inside minded. And so what, what Jennifer learned was if I put my hand here and she dropped down, I said, and I, I could, by discerning of human spirit, say, There, that's the peace of God. That's God Himself in you. That peace is not nothing, that peace is God. He Himself is our peace. Once I told her that and she had a subjective experience of her own, she didn't need me. Well, further teaching, but she didn't need me for that. In other words, I know that I know now. I know when that's existing and I know when that's not. So I says, okay, what do you do when you lose it? All of a sudden, you, don't, you lost your peace. Something happened in the house, neighborhood, school, work. You receive forgiveness, and it goes in three directions. And if in doubt, it's like love. You're not going to love too much. You're not going to forgive too much. If you want to get your peace back, you need to say, am I mad that God didn't do things the way I thought he should? Then I need to release any judgment I made against God. Did I, did I make a judgment against God or his church? The thing that he loves. Because the enemy will find a back door to come in there. I have to release my judgment. So I release loving forgiveness to God, who didn't do anything wrong, by the way. That's the interesting part. <laughs> he didn't do nothing wrong. It was your demands and expectations that got your heart wrong. And you release him. Secondly, self. Well, I'm disappointed or ashamed of my behavior over the last few weeks, months, years. Well, receive forgiveness. Remember, God made you with a particular plan, and he saw you beautiful. You're a one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. So why would you want to be some facsimile of? So you, she learned to forgive God, self, and then, of course, others. And when you forgive others, that is not reconciliation. They may stay as evil as ever. But when you release forgiveness to somebody, you come out of that prison that, it, that they were controlling you with your unforgiveness. And over a period of time, Hebrews 12, 15, beware lest a bitter root spring up in you. And that bitter root doesn't only just spring up in you, it causes you trouble and it defiles others. There's actually people that will push you to sin against them. That's still their sin, but still. That's their bitter root. Now, when, when, you, when, when we were going to begin to move with Jennifer, I had to slow her down because, man, she wanted to deal with everything. She was, oh, man. She thought, I said, three to five things a day and then walk it out. You know what I mean? You don't have to do it. But at first she'd go, I, like, oh, here's, here's the beauty of how smart God is and how this genius lady was shocked at how smart God was, right? She says, I was asked to go do a, a conference somewhere in North Charlotte. And at the last minute, I said, you know, we're both going to do it. You know the material. I am so demonic. That's <laughs> Can you picture her being, I am so demonic. I said, what a sissy demon anyway. But <laughs> I am so demonic. I have to pray in the spirit for days before I can stand up. Because even in graduate school, to stand up and give an oral presentation, her skin would get cold, she'd perspire, and she'd freeze with fear. And she said, I said, well, we don't have three days for you to pray for you to do this. I can't do it. I can't. I said, sit down. Let's pray this through. First person or situation. Now, here's how genius God is, that we are clueless 
It was in the unknown area. And she goes, I don't know. I'm seeing myself lost in the hallway in school. I went out for recess. I had to go to the bathroom. I came in, and then I got lost. I couldn't find my way to the restroom, and I couldn't find my way out. And she had a major panic attack. Well, what does that have to do with public speaking? See, you're not smart enough to know that that fear came in at that time and was contributory. She received forgiveness for taking in that fear. That's a child, you know. The devil don't play fair. He, he work on kids. He loves working on kids. She received forgiveness for taking in that fear. And she takes my microphone to this day, 25 years later, she's still taking my microphone away and she wants to talk. So careful what you pray for. All right? I can't talk. I have to pray for three days before I can speak. Now, who would have... No, let's be honest. There isn't a Christian counselor alive that would have said, hmm, Jennifer, you, have, you get cold and clammy and you have minor fear issues. Well, you have fear issues with public speaking. Hmm, I think it's because you got lost in the first grade. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. Man searched or God searched? I'm always going to choose God's search primarily. Now, the scripture does say confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. But I think the things you should be confessing one to another are, are allowing yourself to see your blind spots and then confessing it and getting it out. And God saying, God, what's the truth? I don't know if we'll get that far today, but anyway. Oh, the man with the work wife, yeah. Wives know these things. She says, um... I feel like my husband at work is a little too close to one of his co-workers. Uh, she's, now she's not there. But just in the dialogue and the stuff that's happening, she kind of intuitively got this hunch. She confronts him, and of course the first thing he said was, I, I led these two people to the Lord. He was Jewish and got led to the Lord. It was beautiful. But he just says, no, there's nothing going on. We just work together. But he was so humble. I said, well, here, do this. Close your eyes. Picture that woman at work. And he went, whoa. He felt a titillation, an excitement. That means there's already an emotional attachment. Your emotions belong to God. They don't belong even, they don't even belong to your wife. Your emotions belong to God. You need to give your wife the fruit of the Spirit. You need to give her that kind of love, that agape love. Isn't that neat? And he dealt with it right then. And what that does then, it doesn't, he don't walk around putting up a flesh wall. That's what most Christians do when they see somebody they don't want or they want space with them. Down here, they go like this. Well, the devil can walk right through that because that's not, that's not God-protected. That's self-protected. Self-protection doesn't work. Now, when, uh, when you, you relinquish forgiveness to somebody, even a perpetrator, you know what's guarding your heart now after you release forgiveness? Peace. Peace will guard your heart. Now, the interesting thing about peace is peace has perception. And it's also why God saw fit scripturally to say, and the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. See, that doesn't register with most people because they see it as passive. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. That means now that when he went to work and, and that lady was at work, he's got God between him and that lady. You can still work together. You can still relate but you've got God. The only legitimate wall is God himself, and he himself is our peace. Now, um, forgiveness is the answer, and it goes in three ways. By the way, most uh, rape victims have had to forgive all three ways, and you, you might have to, too, in some, in some situations. 
But rape victims, all, and this is 40 some years of experiencing this with various people that were raped. Um, first, it's like they get mad at themselves. I shouldn't have went out by myself. I should have known better. They have to receive forgiveness. Then why did God let that happen to me? Why didn't God protect me from that? Then they got to release that judgment they made against God. And then lastly, they have to make that statement that I need to release the perpetrator. And no, that's not reconciliation. You don't have to be afraid of that you're forced to reconcile or somehow they're getting off the hook. That is not biblical forgiveness. They're not getting off the hook. All it, you are the one getting off the hook. You're starting to free yourself so that you are not being controlled. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when it comes to emotional freedom, men don't like the word emotion. They equate that with the feminine gender. Men use the word like stress. I'm stressed at work. I'm stressed in the job. I'm stressed here. I'm stressed there. Definition of stress is to be emotionally controlled, emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. So you better learn to deal with your emotions, male or female. Emo cognition, emo volition. In the 1990s, they found out that the emotions control your thinking and the emotions control your choices. So when we pray first person or situation, one, two, three. First person or situation, Feel the feeling, let it go. By the way, that's a real person. With some prophetic people, we have difficulty because I'll say, what's the first thing you see? I see an eagle. And I see, I know. okay, let's put the eagle on a shelf for right now. We're not going to forgive an eagle to get you sanctified. We're a real person, a real situation. And when you get peace on it, you let forgiveness flow. That peace will guard your heart and your mind and that fruit will remain and the enemy can't attack the fruit of the Spirit. He can't touch the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus is the only one that can take away a toxic emotion. You can suppress it, you can medicate it, but you can't get rid of it. Even uh, Jennifer teaches the science end of that. <clears throat> your cells have gates and channels and emotions are molecules. And they cascade through your whole body. If you got startled, emotion, molecules of emotion went all through your body. But they go on the surface of your cells, have gates and channels, doors that can open and receive that emotion even into your cellular structure. And today, much of your physical ailment is the failure to handle some emotional issues earlier on. Because you can say you're, you're going to suppress it. You control it. <clears throat> you're actually out of control if you think you're controlling. Because what you're so-called controlling is actually staying like little time bombs, buried alive, waiting for an opportunity to explode when you'd rather they didn't. No. <clears throat> In dealing with first feel forgive, I would say in most cases you could do about 20 healings in a row without there being a lie. You know, first feel forgive. And you can start walking in emotional health. You could do it while you're, uh, while you're driving. You can do it. Don't close your eyes though while you're driving. Okay. <laughs> But you can get proficient enough to where you deal quickly, in other words. You disconnect with a toxic emotion, you reconnect. Now, when it comes to thoughts, every 15, 20, 30, 40, who knows? Uh, when I've prayed over the years, they only come up occasionally. And they usually come up uh, right at the time of emotional healing, they kind of shout. It'll be a lie. Uh, a lie that manifests as a repetitive, intrusive thought. Anybody ever have any repetitive, intrusive thoughts? All right, because it becomes a stronghold. And the most important thing 
about dealing with a stronghold is that I used to watch people suffer trying to renounce a lie. I renounce that lie of Jesus. I renounce that I'm afraid. I renounce that I'm afraid. I renounce. You, have, you don't have enough anointing to blow the fuzz off a peanut. Okay? You cannot renounce a lie until the power behind the lie is gone. So if fear of being, I'm afraid I'm going to be uh, abused, I'm afraid, then the first thing you'd have to do is receive forgiveness for taking in the fear. What happens when that happens? Peace. Peace means let the peace of God rule. Who's ruling at that point in time when you feel peace? God. Let the peace of God rule. From that place of peace, you say, I renounce that lie. I renounce that lie that whatever the lie was. And Jennifer sat in many a meetings and was blown away. There's another step. First, feel forgive. That's mostly what you could deal with most emotional healing. Fact. First, feel forgive. Fact. And this is not a formula. This is the way God worked. When he would reveal a lie or an intrusive thought, <clears throat> the next thing was to replace the lie with the truth. And there's nothing more beautiful to watch than to see somebody. I always liked that. My favorite one was always the woman who had to forgive men in general. She'd all. I got a block against men, period. I don't trust men, didn't matter who it was. And we prayed her through. She released forgiveness to where the source was, believe it or not, Father. Released that, released all men that she had judged. And I said, okay, now from a scriptural point of view, Keep your eyes closed and ask God, what's the truth? I know the lie that all men are evil. I renounce that. It's not biblical. Her eyes got that. There's a man in this house here. The man, Christ Jesus. Whoa. For, so for someone who hated men, one of the best revelations was, you got a man living inside of you, the man, Christ Jesus. The greatest man that ever walked the face of the earth. Both God and man. Amen. Wow. And he's living in you. But what did she have to deal with? The man hatred. And, and this, this thing too, you know, men and women, you're equally yoked. I've seen more abused women saying, I have to obey my husband. I have to obey my husband. If your husband is asking you to do something contrary to God, you do not have to obey him. Uh, that's, that's old school religion that's got locked into. You have mutual submission. You're equally yoked in the sight of God. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. If you're if your so-called demands are not loving her like Christ loved the church, you're not loving her, and it's not scriptural. And you don't ask your wife to do something sinful because you're the head of the house. That is not the way scripture reads. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> even I believe what Paul was talking about when, when he says, I don't have um, a man teach over a woman. You know, that's very controversial, but they, they had in the beginning... I had it backwards? Okay. Well, anyway, in Ephesus, uh, there was a women cult. And they had, like, their own cult, cult of Diana. And they, their proponent was, look, every man came from a woman. We are the source. No man has ever birthed the baby, so all of us. And that was what they propagated. Paul came and said, that uh, that's not the way it is. Woman came from Adam's rib. Now, obviously, God is the source, but it had to settle that argument. God created mankind, and then 
woman came from man. So that's how they're saying there's a lot of confusion over some of the scriptures. But in reality, you have to take in context what they were going through at that time. Because there were woman apostles, woman, women uh, teachers, and I'll let the theologians argue what they will. But um, my concern is for the mutual submission to each other of being equally yoked. Loving with God's love toward each other. You can't go wrong then. No matter who's right in all of their theology, love always wins. Knowledge can puff up, but love will edify. So, but Jennifer always liked that part where the feel part. First, feel, forgive. The fact, make sure you've got truth in there and reality, not a lie. And then fill. I said, fill was receiving the fullness of what God has for you scripturally. And what's interesting is, uh, I'm going to close with this. One of the problems that we've seen over the years in ministering to people is that there's a, a, a emotional neediness that people fail to recognize, but the scripture is Jeremiah 2.13. And we're going to close with this. Jeremiah 2.13 says, My people have committed two evils. They forsook me, the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns. And what that, what that really means is you trying, you have legitimate needs. Tell me if these aren't legitimate. You have a need for love, hope, peace, right? Is this legitimate? You have a need for that. You need to belong. You need to affirm. Affirmation. You need significance. You need acceptance. You need approval. You need purpose. You need identity. You need security. Those are legitimate needs. But you are a clever individual in the flesh, and whatever need is not being met righteously by God, you have found a substitute. And Jeremiah 2.13 says, My people have committed two evils. They forsook me as the source or the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, substitutes. So you may have had legitimate needs. You want to make progress in your life? Find out what that legitimate need is. What did you need and didn't receive? What did you need from mom and dad and didn't receive? You might have received a lot of good things. There might have been some things you wished you would have had and you didn't have. You release forgiveness to them and you release the demand and expectation and then you open your heart that I will have that need met by God himself. And uh, <coughs> we're closing now, but I want to cover one thing. My dad rejected me from the time I was born. My grandpa rejected him. I dealt with it by saying, God, I release any demand and expect. My dad couldn't give me that. I release any demand. I'm getting it from you. And God says, I'm giving you, Dennis, my undivided attention. You're not invisible. And guess what? Years later, because I released that and I got it, I got my need met by God, not my father who was not even capable, and my grandfather who was not capable to give it to him. I looked and I opened my eyes and I had men come forward, particularly at an altar call for men who needed an affirming word through a male voice. And I looked up, and there's my dad with tears flowing down his face, receiving from me. I couldn't give him something that I didn't have. I couldn't give him the affirmation he would have needed if I was still wounded and hurt by what he didn't do. Time to forgive people. And time to work on blind spots and let God point out, like David, search me, O God, for any anxious thoughts any hurtful ways, things that are secret faults to me, but they're not secret to you, God. I want to know them. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.